begin with a, with a word of scripture to ground what we do and who we are in the word of God. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one of them heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontius, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And they will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let us pray. O God, who on this day taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things, and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So this is it. This is the moment that we have been waiting for. The Holy Spirit has come. Jesus breathes upon his church, bringing new life, a share in his heavenly life, a super mundane life whose character, whose abundance exceeds even that irrepressible exuberance of resurrection life. Easter is completed, and not only completed, is it intensified. The church quakes with the power of the Spirit of God. The place where we pray is shaken. The world, indeed, is shaken, shaken to its very foundations, for the Spirit of God is poured out upon the people of God to the glory of God, into the consummation of his great and inscrutable purposes. This is not something we can fake. This is not something we can stir up within ourselves. It is the action of God upon his people God acting sovereignly by his sovereign spirit, ruling in his church, his body and bride. It is, in with, it is in this context and within the power of this spirit that Jesus issues his great commission. It is here that he gives that striking command to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to make disciples of all nations. As the Father has sent me, so am I sending you, Jesus says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is the reality that is activated in us by the Holy Spirit. But how can this be? It seems so remote from our everyday experience, even from our every Sunday church experience. 2,000 years on, it seems that rather than this act of God taking the world by storm, instead this church birth at Pentecost has been taken up in the storms of this world and torn apart by them destroyed in all but name. It seems that that way at the best of times, but here we are in what is not the best of times, to say the least, in this time 
of coronavirus, this season of great anxiety and uncertainty, of apartness rather than being together all in one place, of unprecedented unprecedentedness, when we have been so completely deprived of our usual means of communion, those great sacraments through which our Lord, by the power of his Spirit, pledges to us his very trough and makes us members of himself and one another. The time has come. The day of the Lord is at hand, and as it turns out, we are being torn apart by the very things that are tearing the world apart. This great sickness, this great fear, this mess, this malaise, recession, depression, decline. The church is the salt of the earth. It is a salt that seems thoroughly trampled underfoot. It is the light of the world. It is the light concealed, if not extinguished. The church is the ark of salvation. It seems she's being sucked down the same drain as everyone else, swirling ever more rapidly into the terrible sewer of imperial hubris, altogether captive to the powers and principalities that dominate this age. And this may even be a generous assessment. Because in point of fact, she doesn't seem to be making this descent as a single vessel, but as a ship that has been blown apart into thousands of tiny little pieces with each man white-knuckled, clinging to his own little splinter of that ship and yelling at every other desperate drowning sailor amidst the roaring of the seas and the fury of the winds, while together all sink deeper into the abyss. It's not Pentecost when we look out at the world. If anything, it's the opposite of Pentecost. It's a renewal of Babel, the tower of Twitter. We're all on the, on the same platform, but somehow that has made us more difficult to comprehend one another, not less. Each man tweets in his own ideological tongue, and we are scattered, unable to comprehend one another. So we look at Pentecost and we say, how can this be? We see in, in Pentecost, in this ecclesiophany, this manifestation of interior life and essence of the church, a picture of a community rooted in Christ, empowered by the Spirit, sent out into all the world. We see flames of the Spirit licking through the church, and spilling out, setting the world on fire. All tribes of the earth are there, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. The Spirit stirs up the people of God to proclaim the works of God and the wonders of God and the great mysteries of his gospel, that God in Christ Jesus is reconciling all things to himself. And we see the world responding. Though some laugh, others become a part of this family of faith. What's birthed out of this moment at Pentecost that extends beyond the reading we have for today at the ends of Acts chapter 2, we hear how those who welcomed this message were baptized. Thousands of persons added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers that all came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, selling their possessions and goods and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. So we, we look at Pentecost, and we look at that church that's birthed, and we see that distance between that church and our church. I'm sorry to say our church doesn't look much like that, and nor, nor does any church. Not that church communities and institutions don't do beautiful and amazing things, that there aren't these moments of tremendous grace and uh, power that rock church communities. Certainly this happens. Praise God and may his name be glorified in them. But the great things that we do, and even the greatest things, are nowhere near the greatness of God or the vision of the peaceable kingdom towards which his gospel points. They're rather like a candle trying to illuminate the sun, or better yet, they're like a candle trying to illuminate the essence of light itself. We cannot by our efforts accomplish in history what God alone can and does accomplish by the Spirit sent by his Son to and working through and in his people. So, this being the case, what do we do with this? In awe, we stand and we celebrate. We say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, send your spirit. Lord, do your work in us. Complete that good work you have started in us as you promised you would. And what do we do in this time, in this season, at this moment, 
in a time that is especially uncertain? How can we be a sent-out church in a shut-in, shut-down world? How is it that we can face this explosion of the Spirit and yet still find ourselves locked behind closed doors? What is God doing? How is his breath stirring his people, revealing his salvation, showing his kingdom to this broken world? Well, that's what lies in front of us. I was hoping to have some answers to give, but I realized that this is what's left for us to discern today and in these days ahead. These are strange times, but they are also exciting times. God is at work even when we don't understand him. The Spirit is alive in the church, and that is caught up in the midst of. and defines us in these times and at all times. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He ascended into heaven and is at God's right hand over all the forces of chaos and evil that dominate our age. There he ever lives and intercedes for us. There he shall reign until his glorious coming again to finish the work he has started. In the meantime, he sent his Holy Spirit to unite us in and as his body and empower us to do his work in the world, that work which is, above all, to believe in the one whom God has sent and to see in the cross of Christ that sense in the midst of a senseless world. This is the story that defines us. Hear it afresh and hear verbal also to our lips that in our the Father would be glorified in the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>